but you can turn to Genesis chapter 1, please. I'm thankful to be here. I'm thankful for uh, the faithfulness of this church, the faithfulness of your pastor. It's a great blessing. Genesis chapter 1, we're going to be looking. This is going to be, Lord willing, a two-part message, so you're going to have to come back tonight unless the rapture happens. If the rapture happens, you don't need to come back, but otherwise, please come back tonight because this is a two-part message, all right? So we're looking at God's purpose for blessing all nations of the earth, and let's go ahead and open in prayer. Father, we're thankful for the privilege of being able to be in your house. Thank you for Christ's resurrection from the grave. Thank you for uh, his uh, sending the spirit to strive with men, to draw them to Christ. And we know that uh, your word teaches that you want all to come to repentance. You do not want any to perish. You want the praise of all the nations of the earth. You want all to praise you, the, all the people you want to praise you. So we pray that you would help us to have that same heart that you have. You bless the preaching of your word, uh, strengthen me, and empower me as I preach it, and that you'd strengthen the people of God here and use your word and the truth in these passages we're going to be looking at in their lives. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so uh, God's purpose for blessing all nations of the earth. So what we're going to be doing today uh, here, we're going to see that God has a purpose for blessing all of his creation and all of mankind. Mankind is the height of his creation for his glory. So through all past dispensations, in the current dispensation, uh, God has been and continues to work his plan for blessing all nations of the earth. And the disciple-making church of Jesus Christ fits within that larger background of God's purpose in the past and God's purpose in the future. So what is this purpose that God has for blessing all nations of the earth, and how do we see it fulfilled all through time? Well, we're going to look at that today. So first we're going to look at God's pre-fall purpose, his pre-fall purpose, and this is here in Genesis 1, 26 through 28, God's purpose even before the fall. So look at uh, that passage, please. It says, And God said, Let us make man in our image after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, uh, and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. And God blessed them. And God said unto them, Be fruitful, and multiply, and replenish the earth, and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the fowl of the air, and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. So we can see here that God created the first people, Adam and Eve. He blessed them, and so in so blessing, he blessed the whole human race. So us, the Holy Trinity, created uh, God in his own image and commanded them to multiply and fill the earth. So in verse 28, where it says to replenish the earth, the idea is, is to fill up the earth, to fill the entire earth with a vast multitude of holy people who would be in fellowship with the holy God. So God himself is the highest good, and he wanted the entire earth filled with his image bearers, praising him and giving him glory. So this is God's purpose even before the fall. Now, you don't need to turn there necessarily, but John 1.18 says, No man hath seen God at any time. The only begotten Son, which is in the bosom of the Father, he hath declared him. So the Son, no one's ever seen God the Father, but people have seen God the Son. He's the one who declared, who revealed the Father. So when Adam and Eve were walking with and fellowshipping with Jehovah in the Garden of Eden, they were not seeing God the Father, for no man has seen him at any time. Who were they seeing? They were seeing God the Son. They were seeing he who is eternally begotten by the Father. In the words of Micah 5, 2, it says his goings forth have been from of old, from everlasting. So the Son is eternally begotten of the Father, and in time the Son is the one who reveals the Father. He's going forth from the Father to reveal the Father in time. So Jehovah the Son is uh, the Word, like John 1, 1 says. He's the Word, the one who comes forth from, who reveals, who explains the Father. He takes from the Father what he knows, and he shares the Father's intimate counsels with men uh, while from uh, being in that intimate fellowship that he has with the Father, and he brings those counsels to mankind. So he reveals these precious truths from the Father 
the good purposes of the Father and shows them to men. This is what the Son does. So here we see this blessing on mankind in Genesis 1, 26 to 28 was made by the Son before his incarnation to Adam and Eve. Whether uh, the Son was standing before them in a bodily form, like those when he appeared to the Old Testament saints as the messenger or angel of Jehovah, or whether in a voice or whatever form of revelation, it was still the Son of God, the eternal word, who was giving Adam and his wife this blessing, and this blessing of filling the earth. Now, doubtless Adam and Eve would have been filled with joy and filled with delight at this blessing from their God, at this thought of filling the earth with a vast multitude who would, who would praise the Lord would be very delightful to them. And doubtless they were amazed at the privilege they had at being able to participate in God's glorious plan of filling the earth, filling his creation with people who would be for his praise. But Adam and Eve, even though they would have been amazed at this, would not have had the understanding that was in the one who was speaking to them. So the Son of God, who is giving them this revelation, who is giving them this promise, foresaw the fall and foresaw the redemption that he would accomplish and apply and foresaw the unfolding of his purpose of grace in history to bring this world of holy men to pass in a way that Adam and Eve could not even begin to comprehend. So here, God is telling Adam and Eve to fill the earth, and there's going to be a whole vast multitude praising me. This is what I want you to have happen. Uh, but he, of course, knew all that was going to be involved in that. It would involve the cross. It would involve the resurrection in a way that it would involve his uh, becoming man and suffering. But what we can see here is that even before the fall, from the creation of the world, God had a purpose to fill the world with his holy image bearers, holy men for his glory and for their inestimable blessedness. That was God's purpose before the fall. Now, if you go to Genesis chapter 3, we can see the fall and the blessing of the gospel immediately preached to the whole human race. So terribly, man fell into sin, plunging the human race into condemnation. Uh, the whole race of man sinned in Adam, became accountable for Adam's sin, became accountable for their sin nature, became accountable for their personal sins. But God himself, the pre-incarnate son who would become man in the future, preached the gospel to the whole human race at this time. Who's the whole human race? Just Adam and Eve. But the whole human race heard the gospel at this time, allowing after the fall every living person to hear the good news about salvation through the coming Savior. Where did the Lord Jesus himself preach the gospel? He did it in Genesis 3 and verse 15. Genesis 3, 15. Here, speaking directly to Satan, but in the hearing of Adam and Eve, he says, And I will put enmity, opposition, between thee and the woman, Satan and Eve, and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. So we see in this verse, there's a promise that the woman's seed, which is an implicit promise of the virginal conception, the virginal birth of the Messiah, that he's the woman's seed, not the man's seed. We see that he would destroy Satan, he would bruise the head of the serpent, he would reverse all the evil that Satan brought into the world. He would crush that opposition. Now this seed would be truly human. He's the seed of the woman. He's a truly human person. But to have the power to crush Satan, to overcome and reverse the effects of sin and death, uh, he would have to be God as well. Only God could overcome all of that. So this God-man, the virgin-born Savior, would be born of a woman, would overcome Satan and the sin and death that Satan caused to enter into the world. Now this would happen through the death, the sacrificial death of the Messiah. Hence, when Adam and Eve trusted in the coming Savior based on the promise of God in Genesis 3.15, and we can see in verse 20 that, that they expressed faith in this promise of the coming Savior. So what did God do right after this expression of faith in his promise? Well, in verse 21, he initiated worship by animal sacrifice. Who thought of animal sacrifice? God thought of animal sacrifice. This animal sacrifice pictured the death of of the Messiah that was to come, the death of the God-man to save people from sin, death, and hell. The death of the animal or the animals and God's clothing and covering the nakedness of Adam and Eve with their skins pictured the God initiated in the free justification of sinners by faith alone through the death of Christ. And so in verse 21 it says, unto Adam also and to his wife 
did the Lord God make coats of skins and clothe them. So they were clothed with these coats of skins from the animals that were killed, and that pictured the righteousness of Christ that would be credited to them by faith uh, in the Messiah. So we see right after the fall uh, of man, we see the gospel is preached to the whole human race, which at this point is just Adam and Eve, but everyone's heard it. Everyone hears the gospel right after the fall. The blessing of the gospel was available to all nations up until the time of the flood. It was available before the fall, we saw, that it had a purpose to fulfill the, the earth with godly people. It's immediately after the fall to Adam and Eve, and between uh, Adam and Eve's time in the flood, the gospel still goes to all people, all the nations. So the gospel was available worldwide. If you have read Genesis, you know that they had very long lifespans right after the fall, which is not surprising in light of Adam's freedom from all genetic defects, and so a very low chance of getting cancer and similar diseases. So if there's no gaps in the genealogies in Genesis, then Adam's son Seth overlapped in his life with Noah for 34 years. So that's Adam's son Seth to Noah, 34 year overlap in their lives. If there are minor gaps in the genealogy, there would still be only a small number of generations that passed away between the time of Adam and the time of the flood. <coughs> so between Adam and the flood, there was bold gospel preaching going on. Jude 14 records Enoch boldly preaching at this time between Adam and the flood. 2 Peter 2.5 tells us that Noah himself was a preacher of righteousness. So people everywhere, Genesis 6.3 talks about 120 years of, of God was going to spare them even longer. Very possibly that's how long it took Noah to build the ark. But people everywhere would have heard about the ark that was taking Noah 120 years to build and which probably cost him the constant mockery of the world and almost certainly cost him his life savings and everything his family had saved up. And that ark itself was picturing Christ and salvation that's in him. So Adam himself and the oral passing on of truth and whatever writing they had about the record of, of the gospel in Genesis 3.15, the gospel was available for that large period of time between Adam and the flood. God wanted all nations to be able to hear it, and it was available to all people. The gospel was available to the fallen sons of Adam in the pre-flood world. The blessing of the gospel was available for all the human race immediately after the flood. Immediately after the flood, the gospel was God wanted all nations, all people, to hear the gospel. Noah knew the gospel. Noah passed it on to his children. Immediately after they came off the ark, now there aren't that many critters left after the flood, land animals, right? So there's only a small number of animals. There's not that many clean animals. So if you're offering animal sacrifice and there's only a few animals in the whole world, that's a very costly sacrifice. Percentage-wise, that was the most expensive sacrifice probably that was ever offered in terms of percentages of animals that were alive. But he offered uh, a sacrifice in Genesis 8 and verse 20. What was the sacrifice? It was picturing his faith in the sacrifice of the Savior who was going to come. And God blessed the entire world through that sacrificial offering. God said, I'm not going to destroy the world again with a flood because of uh, this sacrifice that's picturing the work of what my son is going to do. And so he promised he wouldn't destroy the world again with a flood. So Noah knew the gospel, his children knew the gospel, and they would have passed it on. However, Noah was a righteous man, but he still had indwelling sin. We can see he uh, committed the sin of drunkenness. And so his children, his grandchildren, his great-grandchildren needed to trust the Messiah for themselves. Just like if you're here and you have godly parents, you also need to trust the Messiah for yourself. Uh, and so some of them did, and many of them unfortunately did not. And so the worldwide knowledge of the gospel was hindered and reversed as bad parenting led the unsaved children of believers to bring up their own children as heathen. And may that not happen to you, where you're saved, but bad parenting leads to the next generation being heathen. And so this led to um, uh, unsaved people multiplying on the earth. And the worldwide knowledge of the gospel was hindered and reversed as, this, as these uh, heathen people were multiplying. Now, rebellious man refused to fill the earth. They wanted to stay uh, in one place when God told them to spread out. And so they stayed there. They became more and more rebellious. They built the Tower of Babel. 
trying to get up to heaven through their own effort. And as a result, God confused the languages of the nations because this was just getting too rebellious and too wicked. And so finally, they began to fill the earth now. At this point, they spread out when God confuses their languages. But with the confusion of languages as a result of sin, the knowledge of the gospel began to fade and even perish among those who had Noah's genes but not Noah's faith in the Messiah. So God, we see, had a purpose for the gospel uh, after the flood to be available to all people. But if you go to Genesis chapter 12, please, what does Moses record in Genesis right after the recording of the judgment of Babel? So we see God sends everybody out in judgment. There's a judgment. The nations are dispersed. What does he record immediately after recording this judgment? We have the opening of chapter 12, right after Genesis 11. Genesis 12, 1 through 3. Now the Lord had said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country, and from thy kindred, and from thy father's house, unto a land that I will show thee. And I will make of thee a great nation, and I will bless thee, and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. And I will bless them that bless thee, and curse him that curseth thee. And in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. So we see here uh, this statement about all families of the earth being blessed immediately after the judgment. Now Galatians 3.8 is uh, commenting on this passage, and there it says, The scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the heathen through faith, preached before the gospel unto Abraham, saying, In thee shall all nations be blessed. So pitch, placing the call of Abraham right after the dispersion of the nations of Babylon, we can see that this is God's gift of salvation in the midst of judgment. And uh, so this, this is a new beginning in God's plan of blessing. We see here uh, in Genesis 1, God had a purpose for blessing all peoples. Uh, in Genesis 1, 28, throughout this record of, of the covenant God made with Abraham, there's this emphasis on blessing, blessing all nations. So this is this, is this purpose God has of blessing all nations. Now it's going to be through Abraham and through his seed. And so there was that dispersion, and now all the families of the earth are going to be blessed through the seed of Abraham. So Abraham is kind of like a new Adam. God was going to bless all nations through Adam. Now we have a new Adam, Abraham, and the nations are going to be blessed through Abraham. God will bless those who bless him. He will curse those who curse him. So we have the way of life and blessing through Abraham and his seed. And, and when you finish the book of Genesis, in the end of Genesis chapter 49, God gives us more, more insight into the specific person who's the ultimate seed or descendant of Abraham. In Genesis 49, 8 through 12, we see there's this one person who's going to come, who's going to be the lion of the tribe of Judah, who's going to be gathering the people to himself in Genesis 49, 10. And so uh, there's a connection uh, that's made there in Genesis 49 back to the Abrahamic covenant promise. And there's a renewal of this theme of blessing. At the end of Jacob's blessings in this poem in Genesis 49, it says, Jacob blessed them. Everyone according to his blessing, he blessed them. So there's this emphasis upon the blessing that's going to come on the nations through Abraham and his seed, uh, the Messiah. So we see here that after the flood, through Abraham, God had a purpose to bless all nations through uh, Abraham and his seed. Now, Israel was called as well to bless all nations with the gospel. So the promises made to Abraham began to be fulfilled as God called Israel to himself, redeemed Israel from Egypt, and brought his redeemed people into the promised land. Now, the word would have gotten around about the plagues in Egypt. Egypt was the most powerful nation on the earth. And here, Israel, their slaves, are brought out from this powerful, powerful nation. And that would have gotten around. What, what happened to Pharaoh's army? They were the, the God of the Israelites did what? He brought these plagues 
He had Pharaoh's own son die. He had the sea open up and swallow up Pharaoh's mighty army. Our gods have never done anything like that. That would get around, wouldn't it? That would get around. The word would have gotten around about drying up the Jordan River, about the fall of Jericho. The word would have gotten around about the sun standing still. Why was that day a few weeks ago? Why was it extra long? That was crazy. What in the world is going on? The God of Israel did that to bring his people into the promised land? Whoa, what is, that's incredible. What's going on with that? Who is this God that can make the sun stand still? Why are we worshiping the sun instead of worshiping him? That would have gotten around, wouldn't it? Uh, look at Joshua 4, please. Joshua 4, 22 through 24. Joshua 4, 22 through 24. We can see in this passage that God explicitly dried up the Jordan for the purpose of all nations knowing about him. Joshua 4, 22 through 24. Then ye shall let your children know, saying, Israel came over this Jordan on dry land. For the Lord your God dried up the waters of Jordan from before you until ye were passed over as the Lord your God did to the Red Sea, which he dried up from before us until we were gone over, that all the people of the earth might know the hand of the Lord, that it is mighty, that ye might fear the Lord your God forever. So God dries up the Jordan. Why? That all the nations of the earth might know that Jehovah's hand is mighty. Go over to Joshua chapter 9. Joshua chapter 9. Remember the Gibeonites. The Gibeonites were afraid of Israel, and they lied about being their neighbors so they wouldn't get killed. Okay? And, you know, if I had to fight an army where the god of the army could just make the walls fall down and could do all these amazing miracles, it would be a bad situation. This would not be a fight. I'd want to be on the other side of that military fight. Right? And they could have. They could have all been like Rahab and said, okay, we surrender, and we're going to become Jews. But they decided not to do that. But the Gibeonites were afraid. And so uh, what made the deceit of the Gibeonites uh, plausible was actually that God did purpose to bless all nations. When they said, we're from very far away, and we, we'll, we'll, we'll see this. We'll read the passage here. Okay. So the deceit of the Gibeonites was believable because reaching out to distant nations was exactly God's purpose in bringing Israel into the land. So that made their deceit plausible. So Joshua 9 and verse 3, we'll start there. And when the inhabitants of Gibeon heard what Joshua had done unto Jericho and to Ai, they did work wildly, and went and made as if they had been ambassadors, and took old sacks upon their asses, and wine bottles old and rent and bound up, and old shoes and clouded upon their feet, and old garments upon them, and all the bread of their provision was dry and moldy. <clears throat> and they went to Joshua unto the camp at Gilgal, and said unto him, and to the men of Israel, we be come from a far country. Now, therefore, make ye a league with us. And the men of Israel said unto the Hivites, Peradventure ye dwell among us, and how shall we make a league with you? And they said unto Joshua, We are thy servants. And then Joshua said unto them, Who are ye, and from whence come ye? And they said unto him, From a very far country thy servants are come, because of the name of the Lord thy God. For we have heard the fame of him, and all that he did in Egypt, and all that he did to the two kings of the Amorites that were beyond Jordan, to Sihon, king of Heshbon, and to Ah, king of Bashan, who is at Ashtaroth. Wherefore our elders and all the inhabitants of our country spake to us, saying, Take victuals with you for the journey, and go to meet them, and say unto them, We are your servants. Therefore now make ye a league with us. This our bread we took hot for our provision out of our houses on the day we came forth to go unto you. But, behold, it is dry and it is moldy. And these bottles of wine which we filled were new. And behold, they be rent. And these our garments and our shoes are become old by reason of the very long journey. And the men took other victuals and asked not counsel the mouth of the Lord. And Joshua made peace with them and made a league with them to let them live. And the princes of the congregation swear unto them. Now, obviously they shouldn't have lied. Okay, that was wrong. But why was this plausible? 
because it was God's purpose that people in very far countries would hear the fame of the Lord thy God. And it was reasonable that they would hear about what happened in Egypt and all these things. Because God did have a purpose for our nations very, very far away to hear the gospel, to hear about the, the Jehovah God of Israel and the Messiah that was going to come through him. So that was what made the deceit plausible because God's purpose was not just to save Israel and let everyone else go to hell, but to have Israel be that light that was sending out light to all nations so that all nations would receive the blessing of God. Consider where God put the nation of Israel. Where did God put the nation of Israel? Did he put them in Iceland so nobody could get to them? No. Did he put them in Madagascar? No. Did he put them in Alaska? Did he put them in New Zealand? No. Where did he put them? He put Israel right where Asia and Europe and Africa go. Right in the middle. Why did he put them there? Because everyone's traveling through there when they're trading and everything. Because that's the best possible place on the face of the earth for Israel to be a light to all nations. That's why he put them right there. So not just in the days of Moses and Joshua would the fame of Israel's God have gotten out with the intention of reaching all nations, but likewise in later times. Look at 1 Chronicles 14.17. 1 Chronicles 14, 17. Likewise, in later times in Israel's history, when the nation was spiritually refreshed and enlivened, when like Psalm 86, uh, that you're, when, when they were, revive us again, that the people may praise you, uh, when, when this was happening in Israel, the, the word about Jehovah and his Messiah was getting out to the nations. So 1 Chronicles 14 and verse 17, the Bible says, and the fame of David went out into all lands, and the Lord brought the fear of him upon all nations. So all the lands here, all the nations are hearing about the fame of David. Likewise, in the days of King Hezekiah, look at 2 Chronicles 32, 23. 2 Chronicles 32, 23. <clears throat> so what happened in the days of King Hezekiah? Jehovah showed himself more powerful than the Assyrian world empire. Assyria is the world empire. God had shown himself in the past stronger than Egypt, the most powerful nation of that day. God here is showing himself more powerful than Assyria, the most powerful empire of the day. And by, by killing 185,000 Assyrian soldiers as they're gathered against Jerusalem, and you know he just has to go back because his army's gone. So 2 Chronicles 32:23, And many brought gifts unto the Lord, to Jerusalem, and presents to Hezekiah, so that he was magnified in the sight of all nations from thenceforth. So the word about what Jehovah did to the Assyrian army got out all over the place, which it would. Everybody was afraid of the Assyrian army. God comes in, boom, this is the end of your army. So they would be saying, what? The God of Israel destroyed the entire Assyrian army? <coughs> that army of which we're so afraid? The army which our gods couldn't do anything to stop? Who is this God? Who, who is, how, is he, how is he able to do that? Uh, why, who is this powerful God who is able to destroy the army of the Assyrians? So we can see that God's purpose for Israel uh, was that through them all nations would be blessed, like God had promised to Abraham. Go to Psalm 117. Psalm 117. We're going to see that Israel's inspired hymn book, the book of Psalms, has lots of missionary hymns. We sung some missionary songs today, songs about getting the gospel out to the ends of the earth. Well, that's also in God's inspired songbook, the Psalms. There's lots of missionary songs in God's inspired songbook, and the Israelites would sing these inspired songs. And the Lord Jesus sang these inspired songs to the Father and, and, and showing uh, his own heart and the Father's heart as he sung the psalms to the Father. So Psalm 117, the shortest psalm. This is, this is the, the, the chorus, uh, the little uh, uh, chorus in the book of Psalms. Shortest book, oh, uh, song in the Psalms, Psalm 117. Oh, praise the Lord, all ye nations. Praise him, all ye people, for his merciful kindness is great toward us. And the truth of the Lord endureth forever. Praise ye the Lord. That's hallelujah. So what does the shortest psalm say? It says, all the nations praise God. All the people 
praise God. God doesn't just say, I want Israel to praise me, and I don't care about everybody else. He wants all nations to praise God. That's what they were singing about. Look at Psalm 67. Psalm 67. They prayed in Israel for Jehovah to bless them so that all the nations would hear the truth. All the nations were to hear the truth through the nation of Israel. Psalm 67. To the chief musician on Naginoth, a psalm or song. God be merciful unto us and bless us and cause his face to shine upon us. Selah. That thy way may be known upon earth, thy saving health among all nations. Let the people praise thee, O God. Let all the people praise thee. Oh, let the nations be glad and sing for joy. For thou shalt judge the people righteously and govern the nations upon earth. Selah. Let the people praise thee, O God. Let all the people praise thee. Then shall the earth yield her increase, and God, even our own God, shall bless us. God shall bless us, and all the ends of the earth shall fear him. So they wanted Jehovah to bless them, but all the nations of the earth would hear his truth. Go to Psalm 72. Psalm 72. They also sang about the coming days of the personal rule of the Messiah, when all nations would praise Jehovah, and were to allow the coming fulfillment to that, the coming kingdom, the future kingdom, when all the nations would, would be blessing Jehovah, that was to encourage them to spread his praise even in their own time. Just like us, when we see that God is going to come and he's going to rule the earth over all nations in the future, that should encourage us even now to be getting the gospel to all nations of the earth. So Psalm 72, a psalm for Solomon, the son of David. Give the king thy judgments, O God, and thy righteousness unto the king's son. This is the Messiah. He shall judge thy people with righteousness, and thy poor with judgment. The mountains shall bring peace to the people, and the little hills by righteousness. He shall judge the poor of the people. He shall save the children of the needy, and shall break in pieces the oppressor. They shall fear thee as long as the sun and moon endure throughout all generations. He shall come down like rain upon the mown grass, as showers that water the earth. In his days shall the righteous flourish, an abundance of peace, so long as the moon endureth. He shall have dominion also from sea to sea, and from the river unto the ends of the earth. They that dwell in the wilderness shall bow before him, and his enemies shall lick the dust. The kings of Tarshish and of the isles shall bring presents. The kings of Sheba and Seba shall offer gifts. Yea, all kings shall fall down before him. All nations shall serve him. For he shall deliver the needy when he crieth, the poor also, and him that hath no helper. He shall spare the poor and needy, and shall save the souls of the needy. He shall redeem their soul from deceit and violence, and precious shall their blood be in his sight. And he shall live, and to him shall be given of the gold of Sheba, that's the best gold from a distant land. Prayer also shall be made for him continually, and daily shall he be praised. There shall be a handful of corn in the earth upon the top of the mountains. The fruit thereof shall shake like Lebanon, and they of the city shall flourish like grass of the earth. His name shall endure forever. His name shall be continued as long as the sun, and men shall be blessed in him. All nations shall call him blessed. Blessed be the Lord God, the God of Israel, who only doeth wondrous things. And blessed be his glorious name forever. And let the whole earth be filled with his glory. Amen and amen. See the vehement longing and prayer for this day when the whole earth would be filled with Jehovah's glory. It doesn't just receive one amen. It says amen and amen. I want this really bad. 7220. The prayers of David, the son of Jesse, are ended. So this theme of the coming glory of the days of the Messiah, when all nations would praise Jehovah and the end of the earth would be filled with his glory, that's the theme upon which David, the son of Jesse, would end his prayers. That's what he was focused upon. In that coming, that coming day, David, of course, and Solomon and their godly descendants sang these psalms, and as they sang these psalms, they sought to make their thrones and their kingdom reflect the character of the Messiah that was coming of whom they were the types and foretastes. 
so that in part, that glorious future when all nations would see the glory of the Lord would be reflected even at that time in their kingdom. So they're talking about the coming kingdom, but they're saying we want this to be happening even now. Even now we want all the nations to praise God. Look at Psalm 22, please. Psalm 22. David saw the day in Psalm 22 when the Messiah would be crucified. Psalm chapter 22, verse 1. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Why art thou so far from helping me and from the words of my roaring? Of course, that's what Christ cried out on the cross. We're not going to go through the whole psalm, but David foresaw. Look at verses 16 through 18. Here we see Christ on the cross. For dogs have compassed me. The assembly of the wicked have enclosed me. They pierced my hands and my feet. As here the Lord Jesus is hanging on the cross. I may tell all my bones. They look and stare upon me. They part my garments among them and cast lots upon my vesture. So we see the crucifixion. But after this time, the Messiah would be delivered and raised from the dead, as it says in verse 20. Deliver my soul from the sword, my darling from the power of the dog. Save me from the lion's mouth, for thou hast heard me from the horns of the unicorn. So the Messiah has this cry of forsakenness at the beginning of the psalm, but he's going to be delivered. He's going to rise from the dead. It's not going to stop with him forsaken. He's going to be delivered. Jehovah will raise the Messiah from the dead. And that was in Christ's mind when he quoted Psalm 22 on the cross as well. So after the resurrection of the crucified Messiah, in Psalm 22, 22, the Messiah would have congregations, assemblies, where he would praise the Father as the mediator for his redeemed people. Look at Psalm 22, 22. I will declare thy name unto my brethren. In the midst of the congregation will I praise thee. And Paul quotes this in Hebrews chapter 2 uh, about God getting praise in the church. Uh, and so when here in, in, in the Lord's church, we actually can have Jesus praising the Father uh, by the Spirit through us. Psalm 22, verse 22. So here, uh, the congregations here are praising uh, the, the Lord. And then a day would come when all nations, again, would be praising Jehovah. Psalm twenty-two, twenty-three: Ye that fear the Lord, praise him. All ye the seed of Jacob, glorify him. And fear him, all ye the seed of Israel. For he hath not despised nor abhorred the affliction of the afflicted, the Messiah. Neither hath he hid his face from him. But when he cried unto him, he heard. My praise shall be of thee in the great congregation. I will pay my vows before them that fear him. The meek shall eat and be satisfied. They shall praise the Lord that seek him. Your heart shall live forever. All the ends of the world shall remember and turn unto the Lord. And all the kindreds of the nations shall worship before thee. So we can see that Israel's Psalms, their inspired hymn book, is full of the evangelistic purpose of Jehovah to reach all nations, to bring them all to submission to and faith in the crucified and risen Messiah, and through the Messiah to be saved by Jehovah. So Old Testament Israel longed for, and they sang about this purpose of God to redeem all nations. The Lord Jesus sang these inspired and fallible prayers to the Father. Today, we can sing the Psalms and sing to the Father these inspired missionary songs that the Savior sang, understanding them in light of the fulfillment that Christ has made, having died and risen from the dead. So we can see this purpose that God didn't just want Israel to be saved. He had a purpose for all nations in the times of Israel, just like he had before the nation of Israel in the days of Abraham, just like he had in Noah's day, just like he had before the flood, just like he had before the fall. He wanted the whole earth filled with people praising him all over the place, everywhere. Now, when Israel sinned and they were dispersed among the nations, Israel's failure and their dispersion in the exile still contributes to the blessing and the spread of the gospel Jehovah intended for all nations in Abraham's seed. So Israel's spread among all nations, the judgment on Israel when they were dispersed abroad, this still contributed to the spread of the gospel and the praise that God was going to get through all nations. If you look at Deuteronomy chapter 30, please. Deuteronomy chapter 30. There is, so Israel was going to sin, and Moses predicted this, and would fail to keep the covenant that God gave to Moses. 
Uh, and that's because only the Lord Jesus was able to meet the standard of the perfect uh, requirement of obedience required by the law. And Deuteronomy predicted that Israel would be scattered from the land among the nations and would eventually be regathered. So in Deuteronomy chapter 30, the Bible says, starting in verse 1, And it shall come to pass, when all these things are come upon thee, the blessing and the curse which I have set before thee, and thou shalt call them into mind among all the nations, whither the Lord thy God hath driven thee, and shalt return to the Lord thy God, and shalt obey his voice according to all that I command thee this day, thou and thy children, with all thine heart and with all thy soul, that the Lord thy God will turn thy captivity and have compassion upon thee, and return and gather thee from all the nations, whither the Lord thy God hath scattered thee. If any of thine be driven out unto the outmost parts of heaven, from thence will the Lord thy God gather thee, and from thence will he fetch thee. And the Lord thy God will bring thee into the land which thy fathers have possessed, and thou shalt possess it, and he will do thee good, and multiply thee above thy fathers. And the Lord thy God will circumcise thine heart, and the heart of thy seed to love the Lord thy God, with all thine heart and with all thy soul, that thou mayest live. Now here it's talking about the regathering of Israel. But notice he mentions they would be scattered to the outmost parts of heaven. The Israelites would be dispersed abroad from that central location where Africa, Asia, and Europe all come together and be spread out all over the place uh, uh, into the vast distant portions of the earth. So it might seem from simply a fallen human perspective that the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem in 586 B.C., that would seem like maybe this is the end of God's purpose for all nations to worship Jehovah. I mean, the temple's destroyed, this has to be the end. But actually, his purpose was advanced through scattering Israel among all the nations, even with the destruction of the temple. Now, uh, we can see this in uh, the small portions of the Old Testament that are written in the language called Aramaic. The vast majority of the Old Testament is in the Hebrew language, right? The language of the Jews their native tongue. But there are small portions that were given by inspiration of God in the language of Aramaic. What's Aramaic? Aramaic was the world language of the time. It was kind of like English is today. It's the language everybody, whatever he spoke is his first language, you taught your kids Aramaic so they could communicate with people from far away. So, you know, if you're in China, you want your kids to learn English so they can, you know, communicate with people. Uh, if you know Spanish, it's great if you learn English, too, because so many people speak English. I mean, people, obviously, lots of people speak Spanish, too. But Aramaic was the world language, okay? The language of the nations, the language of the heathen, the language of the peoples of the earth was Aramaic. Now, small portions of the Old Testament are written in the Aramaic language. What do we learn from these small portions of the Old Testament in the Aramaic language? Well, we're going to look at the earliest. Go to Psalm chapter 2, please. Psalm chapter 2. And here in Psalm 2, we see the earliest Aramaic in Scripture, with one exception. There, in, in the book of Genesis, there's, there's a place name that's in Aramaic. This one word is called uh, Jagar Hadutha. That's Aramaic. But other than that one place that's Aramaic, Psalm 2 is the earliest place we see any Aramaic. Now, Psalm 2 is in Hebrew, but we're going to point out where there's Aramaic in Psalm 2. So go to Psalm chapter 2, please. David here is singing this psalm under inspiration of God. He gives us this psalm. Psalm 2. Why do the heathen rage and the people imagine a vain thing? The kings of the earth set themselves, and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, Let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cords from us. He that sitteth in the heavens shall laugh. The Lord shall have them in derision. Then shall he speak unto them in his wrath and vex them in his sore displeasure. Yet have I set my king upon my holy hill of Sion. I will declare the decree the Lord has said unto me, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. Ask of me, and I shall give thee the heathen for thine inheritance, and the uttermost parts of the earth for thy possession. Thou shalt break them with a rod of iron, thou shalt dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. Be wise now therefore, O ye kings, be instructed, ye judges of the earth, Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the son, lest he be angry and ye perish from the way when his wrath is kindled but a little. Blessed are all they that put their trust in him. So here the heathen nations are warned about their rage against Jehovah and his Messiah, his anointed one. So the father's eternally begotten son, the Messiah, is going to rule from Jerusalem. 
And that would, of course, encourage David and his progenitors on the throne of the kingdom of Israel. So the Messiah will have all the nations. The uttermost parts of the earth will be his possession. He will dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel when they don't believe in him. So what are all the nations supposed to do? If you don't want to get dashed in pieces, well, be wise and listen up. Don't get dashed into pieces. Instead, reverently submit to the Messiah, like it says in Psalm 211. The Messiah is their king. Repent of rebellion to him. Submit to the Son of God. And then you have Psalm 212. Kiss the Son, O heathen nations, lest he be angry and you perish from the way when his wrath is kindled but a little. Blessed are all they that put their trust in him. So kiss the Son. What's that? Embrace and kiss him. Like Genesis 29, 13 and 33, 4, there's a connection. Embrace, kiss. So draw nigh to the Son. Turn away from rebelling against the Son of God. Embrace the Son of God in love. It's the opposite of what they should be doing with Baal. Like in 1 Kings 19, 18, uh, Elijah said, or, or God said to Elijah that he had 7,000 left in Israel, which have not bowed unto Baal, and every mouth has not kissed Baal. So, listen, heathen nations, no longer kiss your idols and have affection for them, but reject your idols and kiss the sun. Kiss the sun. Why? Because blessed are all they that put their trust in him. Jew or non-Jew, all nations, all peoples, trust in the Son of God, and you'll be blessed in time. Trust in the Son of God. You'll be blessed for eternity. He will save you by his grace through repent and faith in him. When you submit to him as your king, when you embrace him, when you trust in him. This is what David is telling the heathen nations in Psalm chapter 2. Now, where's the Aramaic here? The word son in Psalm 2.12 is the Aramaic form of the word son instead of the Hebrew form. So the whole psalm is Hebrew, but when he says kiss the son, he puts that word son in the language of the heathen nations. Listen, nations, the son. Listen, all peoples of the earth, embrace God's Son, and you will be saved. And if you do not, he will dash you in pieces, and you will perish. So the first use of Aramaic in Scripture, outside of that place that was, was named in Genesis 31, 47, the first use of Aramaic in Scripture is a gospel call to all the nations of the world to trust in the Son of God and receive blessing, receive eternal blessing. And remember, blessing is that Abrahamic covenant word, uh, that word that God, all the nations of the earth, will be blessed in Abraham's seed. So here is that seed. Here is the seed, the Messiah, the Messiah, the Son of God, be blessed by trusting in him. There's more that we're going to say about Aramaic, Lord willing, tonight. Okay, So you have to come back tonight to learn more about that. But we're going to start making a few applications, and then we're going to have more applications tonight, Lord willing. So you, you better come back. Okay, Trust in the Son of God and come back to church. So first application we're going to make, though, so you get some application today, is God's purpose to bring the knowledge of himself to all nations is part of his eternal purpose. God has an eternal purpose to call all nations and bless all peoples of the earth. So when you preach the gospel in your local Jerusalem here, when you pray for, when you financially support, when you send forth laborers into the harvest to other lands, when you go yourself to evangelize for the purpose of new churches being established, when you do those things, you're contributing to the divine purpose for the ages. You're not just doing something thought of yesterday. You're doing something that has been on God's heart since the creation of the universe when you give the gospel to people. And in fact, we're going to see tonight, Lord willing, it even stretches earlier than the creation. God had the redemption of people on his heart from every kindred, tongue, and nation from eternity past. Okay? So we're going to see that tonight in John 17. So uh, when you give that gospel tract out, when you give that dollar to the cause of world evangelism, when you pray for your world evangelists in foreign nations, when you knock on that door, when you do that evangelistic Bible study with somebody, when you bring that needy family to your home and open your home to them and show them hospitality and you open your mouth and preach the gospel to them, when you explain the gospel to that coworker, these are not just individual righteous acts that are good to do. They are ways in which you're fitting in with God's eternal purpose of calling nations to himself from all peoples of the earth through Jesus Christ. It's an amazing thing. You are contributing to this plan that God has from the, for the ages when you preach the gospel. What a privilege. 
What an amazing thing. You get to work with God in his infinitely wise, his infinitely glorious purpose to glorify himself through saving sinners by Jesus Christ. What a privilege. What an amazing thing. So when you're fulfilling the Great Commission, this is not just some thing thought of yesterday. This is part of God's eternal purpose that you get to be part of. You're privileged to be part of. What a blessing. Another application. When you contribute to world evangelism by praying, by going, by giving, in all other ways, you're in a wonderful company. You're in the company of the greatest saints in all of human history. People stand in line for hours to get the signature or the picture of a tall guy who's good at throwing a ball into a metal circle. Oh, I really want that guy's signature. He can throw a ball into a metal circle, and I'm going to stand in line for hours because he's so important. Okay? They'll do a great deal to have even a tiny level of association with such a person. I'm going to pay 10000 I mean, a huge sum of money because I want a picture with that guy standing next to him with a signature. That's so great. Man, I'll do anything to have that happen. Okay? Uh, they'll do a great deal to associate themselves with such a person who's good at putting a ball in hoop. But when you advance the missionary cause, you're joining with God himself. The first one whoever preached the gospel in person to Adam and Eve. God himself preached the gospel to Adam and Eve. God accompanies the preaching of his word by humans by the blessing of his spirit. 1 Peter 3, 18 and 22 teaches that when you preach the gospel, it's Christ preaching by the spirit through you. Wow! Christ preaching by the spirit through you. 1 Corinthians 3, 9 says you're a co-laborer with God. A co-laborer with God. So you're associated with God and his eternal purpose when you contribute to preaching the gospel to all nations. You're also in the company of the, 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 the greatest people from the eternal perspective. You're in the company of gospel preachers from Enoch to Noah to Moses to Elijah to uh, Isaiah to John the Baptist to Peter to Paul to the Lord Jesus himself in his earthly ministry. What did he do? He went around preaching. That's what he did. You stand among the truly excellent of the earth, of all ages, and the excellent of the new heavens and new earth, when you pray, when you give, and when you go with the gospel. What a privilege. You get to be part of God's eternal purpose. You get to associate yourself with this thing that's been on God's heart from all eternity when you preach the gospel, and you get to be part of uh, God spreading the truth to all the nations of the earth. Lord willing, we'll see more about this tonight. But let those facts affect you. Let them encourage you. Let them strengthen you to go on against opposition because God is with you. This is a wonderful, this is an important, this is a glorious thing when you get to be part of preaching the gospel and spreading his glorious praise to all the nations of the earth. Let's pray. Father, we're thankful for uh, the fact that you didn't just uh, want to save you know, two or three people from one group of, of people and let everyone else go to hell, but that you are not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Thank you for the fact that it was your purpose uh, from Adam and Eve's time, through Noah's time, through Abraham's time, through Moses' time, that it's your purpose that all nations would hear the gospel, that all nations would believe on the Son of God and kiss him and embrace him and trust in him. Lord, help us to be encouraged to sacrifice ourselves for this glorious cause when we see that it's on your heart we see how important it is to you help us to identify ourselves with that to be uh, confident in that to uh, to serve you in this glorious way to have those beautiful feet that preach the gospel of peace help us to grow in this area and to obey and fulfill your will for your glory and out of love for you and we pray this in jesus name